Welcome to today's part of this SPSS methodology, this time with a unit on discriminant analysis. What are we going to use discriminant analysis for? Well, imagine we have different categories and we non want to know when one of our observations needs to be assigned to the first category, the second, the third, or whatsoever category. This could be, for example, we have different marketing campaigns, different advertisement strategies. We want to assign which will actually be the most efficient one. So we need to assign a specific campaign to a specific client. Another way, if we're working somewhere in finance and we have different risk categories and according to the different risk categories, the interest rate someone has to pay for a loan differs. So we need to assign the people to the different risk categories. In either of those cases, we can assume that we know something about our clients, about our customers. We want to use this information to get a well decent enough or as good as a possible assignment into one of those predefined categories. For example, we can take a look here. We have the classified BMI and we can think, well, let's consider four different aspects, height, weight, gender and city where the people come from. And using those four variables, we want to make an as good guess as possible about into which category one of our observations falls. So how are we going about this? Well, this is classification of observations. So we go to analyze and here we have the menu classify. We already see down here discriminant as for the discriminant analysis. Click here. Then we can put our grouping variable up here. That was our classified BMI. That's the different categories I'm aiming at. So here we are starting with BMI class 0 and a maximum of 2. So we have three different categories. Our independence would be gender, height and weight. The problem now would be with the city. So I could enter this. The problem then being this is not a dummy variable and well this is not a metric variable. So we have similar problems as we might get with linear regression that we cannot enter any non-metric variables which are not well recoded into dummy variables. So if we want to include this information we would have to construct new variables using here recode into different variables. So to make our life easier well, even if we wanted to include this, at this time, we just skip this information. So we go with gender, height and weight. Gender is possible because gender is a zero, one variable, which could also be explained as yes, if it's one for women or no, if it's zero for men. So this is a typical dummy variable. Why I'm comparing this to linear regression? because discriminant analysis uses, in some part, regression analysis in the background to get the results. So the same restrictions which apply for linear regression apply in a similar fashion for discriminant analysis. So much for the requirements. Then if we take a short look here at the different menus, if we click on statistics, we can get additional informations on the quality of the assignment as with the ANOVA we can test whether our groups are actually to be considered different or whether they overlap too strongly. This is one possibility. A different way we can go about and extending our analysis is if we click on classify. We have here the possibility to take a look, for example, how this assignment process works. 
and in this case let's take a look at the first five classifications this algorithm actually does. Then uh, finally we can generate a summary table giving us an idea how well our method actually works. So we click on continue. This is basically the most important stuff. What's also interesting or could be interesting later on if you go on save you can either save the group membership, the predicted group membership, or the discriminant stores or the probabilities of group membership. In particular here, the group or predicted group membership could be interesting because this works in a similar way as clusterization. So this is more or less similar in some ways to what's done in the different well parts of this field where we want to classify. Here we just skip this because this is not the main goal. The main goal here is just to get a better grasp of the idea how to interpret the results. So we stick with this and then click on OK. All of this starts with a short summary. Here with my group statistics for the different subgroups. So how many observations I have in each of those subgroups. Here I see again this subgroup, the above average person, that's only 33, so that's relatively few. So I can still use this, but the results should be treated rather skeptically because there are quite few observations. Here with average, even with below average, that's okay, but this is a bit few observations. Okay, so far for this part of the requirements. Then we have here two tables with the eigenvalues and Wilkes lambda which well, function like some kind of quality indicators. First part, the eigenvalues should be as large as possible and thereby the canonical correlation should also be as large as possible. Meaning, in particular here, um, the canonical co um, correlation coefficient can be between 0 and 1. So in this case we see for the first function, in this case we need two functions, it's relatively high. So the first classification is this below average or above average uh, or average and be, uh, above average, this works decently enough. The problem arises with the second function, with this function here, which is then the discrimination between average above average. So here this is slightly more problematic. In this case we have three different possible outcomes, below average, average, above average, so we need two different discriminant functions. Thereby we have two functions here and two functions here and here and here. If we were to have only two possible outcomes, two possible groups, we would get only one function. On the other hand, if we were to have five different outcomes, we would have four different functions. So it's always one function less than the amount of different categories. Okay, so much before this, so they work better if the canonical correlation is higher. However, well, this doesn't mean anything. We have here the possibility to use a test for Wilkes Lambda, or basically a chi squared test. Wilkes Lambda works in the opposite direction than the canonical correlation. So a high canonical correlation leads to a low Wilkes lambda and a low canonical correlation leads to a high Wilkes lambda. Okay, but to actually go about this in a decent fashion we can say we run a chi squared test here, an assignment test, and we see if this significance level is below 5%, the assignment works decently enough, we can use 
the underlying data set for our discriminant analysis. So, and in this context we see it works good enough for the first part and the second part it becomes slightly worse but it's still way below even 1% so even the last part works decently enough. Okay, then I mentioned that discriminant analysis is related to linear regression so here the standardized canonical discriminant function coefficients that's basically comparable to coefficients from linear regression analysis. Meaning what we are going to do next is we use those two functions we just estimated and calculate two scores. The two scores come hand in hand with specific thresholds telling us which group to assign our different observations to. So I would get here one value for each case in function 1, one value for each case in function 2. If I compare those two values with their threshold, I will get an idea assign this case to category 1, 2 or 3. Okay, if we then scroll somewhat farther downwards, we get down here what I activated earlier on, an example how this worked for five possible or our first five cases. We always have here the actual group, and the predicted group. In this case we see he didn't make any errors, so this is actually pretty good. However, what's interesting enough, back here, that's the scores I discussed earlier. We see here the first one, that's minus here, relatively large minus here, relatively large minus here, so he is assigned to group 0. I predict group 0 actually is group 0. Then, here and here, I have a comparatively large function 1 and a comparatively large function 2, at least compared to the other values. So this leads to an assignment into group 2, similarly here. Here in this case I have a relatively small value in function 1, negative small value in function 1, or rather larger than this one but smaller than those ones. And in particular I have relatively large values in function 2. This layout leads us to assume this one belongs into group 1. So we see how this assignment works and the advantage here is in this table I also have like the probabilities that if I select the most suitable group, how likely am I to make an error? And that's something which I see here. This is the chance that if this value leads to a value of the discriminant function as is, then this gives the probability that he is actually in the group as assigned. So this is more or less the probability that I'm right in assigning him to this group if he reports those values. And then I see in this case I have relatively large values 0 0.94, 0 0.81, 1, 0 0.89, 1. So I'm pretty sh sure that those assignments are actually good. The second best solution which is actually done here shows us this is the probability that I should assign him to the second best fit. In this case it's not totally ah yes actually in this case it's totally a perfect fit so both of them taken together make up one but it could be if you have a lot of groups 
also be that if you add up those two probabilities you won't add up with exactly 100% because there could also be a very slight chance that it's actually group 3, group 4, group 5 or whatsoever. So here in this case mostly goes with a very large percentage, lar very large certainty into the group as predicted and this is something like the second best error and we see the errors we make will be pretty small. This is also seen if we take a look at the summary. The summary down here tells us predictions versus original. And if I take a look here, I predicted below average in this case from the below averages for 82 for someone who actually is average in 31 cases however with the average guys I write, uh, predicted all of them correctly and with the above average guys I have s 7 who I actually predicted to be ab um, who I predicted they are above average but who are actually only average so I see I make some errors here, but in general I'm relatively good with my assignments. Only 38 observations out of 284 are wrongly assigned. This is what is given down here. 86.6% of the original group cases are correctly classified. So this value down here can be seen as an overall quality measure of how good my classification scheme works. So if I only know, and that's the part we had here, where is this? If I only know those three variables, someone's gender, someone's height, someone's weight, I can easily get an idea, is he regarding the BMI below average, average or above average. Well obviously it makes sense because the BMI results from height and weight but not linearly. So even if I work linearly I will get a decent enough guess about where to assign someone. And well this then already concludes this session on discriminant analysis. I hope you enjoyed listening to it and you learned something from this section. If you want to see more videos of this type, feel free to visit the rest of this SPSS methodology. So until next time, see you and goodbye.